I'd actually like to share this song that we're going to do has a great sentimental value for me. Uh, when I was about Chrissy's age, we uh, went to Oklahoma to visit my grandparents. And uh, my grandmother, who's 80 some odd years old now, um, played this song. And myself and my mother and her sisters all gathered around the piano with her and we all sang this song. I actually have a, a photo of it still. Um, but it's very precious to me. My, my grandmother's not, probably not going to be with us very much longer. Uh, she's, her health is failing. But um, for the, those of us who are grandparents, um, sing, sing to the little ones because they'll remember it. Amen. They'll remember it. There's a question you face You can never erase You must answer it fairly and true Tis of one you have known Who left scepter and throne And came down from above to save you What think ye of Christ? Answer, I say, there is no other way. What think ye of Christ? Above all the world's good and the great he has stood, and with him there is none can compare. And he proffers sweet rest to the poor and oppressed. There is room for your heart in his care. On life's long weary road, where you carry your load, in the midst of your pleasure and pain, in your sorrow and care, in your joy and despair, lo, he meets you again and again. question abides in your heart. You must think and decide, for he stands at your side, waiting pardon and peace to impart. What think ye of Christ? What think ye of Christ? must answer, I say, there is no other way. What think ye of Christ? You must answer, I say, there is no other way. What think ye of Christ? <coughs> Thank you so much. Take your Bibles, if you would, with me. Go to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Great chapter. A chapter Paul beautifully lays out as the human penman. A wonderful case for our Christian life and the power of the resurrection and all the way through it. I love it. Oh, Look, tonight in the last portion, I will begin reading in verse 50 in just a minute. But the last verse of the chapter, he sums it all up and says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The choir is saying, Lord, you've been faithful tonight. 
But God asks us in this passage that he wants us and is looking for us to be faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain the Lord. I want to bring a message entitled tonight, God which giveth us the victory. God which giveth us the victory. You know, from the beginning, the Lord wanted us to know, you find it all through the scriptures, that it is God which giveth the victory. Not by might, not by power, but by spirit, saith the Lord. It's not, the Bible says, not to trust in horses or chariots, but your trust needs to be in God. He is the one that giveth the victory. I think of the story of Gideon. Here are the 135,000 Midianites show up in the valley there, and they're fearful what's going to take place, and God's raised up Gideon, and I won't go into the backstory of that, but now these men have showed up to fight, and here they're at already down four to one, the odds. They have 32,000 men to go against 135,000 Midianites. And God comes to Gideon and says, the people are too many. <laughs> Not the Midianites, you, you have too many. We're, we're outnumbered four to one, Lord, you have too many. He cuts them down, as you know the story, to 10,000, then to 300. Because God wanted them to know, it is God which giveth the victory. Amen. He didn't want them to take the credit for it. He didn't want them to get the glory. He alone wanted to have the glory and honor. And when we have a special day like we had today or other things we're working towards, we have to remember it's God which gives the victory. Anything we're working in life, we're looking to Him. We can take no praise or glory. David said in praising of the Lord for the willing offering of the people as they built the temple, as he was preparing for Solomon's temple that uh, his son would build. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 12, David Praise here and blessing to the Lord before all the congregation. David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. Thou reignest over all, and in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Uh, David, as we remember earlier in his life, said unto Goliath, but not just Goliath, all the armies of Israel needed to hear what David had to say. His faith as he goes to fight the giant before Goliath there. 1 Samuel 17, 44 to 48. And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine. Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. The faith that God would give the victory, not by sword or spear, but God is the one that will give the victory. Then Israel, as they enter the promised land, as you back up a little more in the defeating of Jericho, Joshua, the commander that had been the general for Moses, the, the one out in the battle fighting as Moses held the arms up and the rod of God on the mountainside. Now Joshua is the captain. He's the leader. He is now the one that is to lead God's people after Moses is dead. And God is trying to teach him this great lesson, as has been our theme all year, to be strong in the Lord. Yeah. To be strong in the Lord. It's not by the great plan that Joshua could figure out or the battle plan to defeat Jericho, but God gives him a plan that no, no general would have signed off on. <laughs> This is not a battle plan that any mind, any rationale would have went along with. 
But God is showing them, it is God that giveth the victory. And you know as they march around and then they holler and the walls came down as God said they would. They, God wanted them to know it was no doubt. It's God that gives the victory. I want to see three things this evening from this passage. First, God has given us victory over death. Look at verse 50. God has given us victory over death. Hallelujah. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. What a thought. We can't inherit. I'm flesh and blood, aren't you? We can't inherit, he's saying. Keep reading. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. He said corruption cannot go in, but we'll be raised incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. God has given us victory over death. And we should not all sleep, but the ones that do are sleeping, they'll raise incorruptible. But all of us are going to be changed. In a moment, we'll be changed. We'll have a new body. We'll leave behind, uh, whether this body leaves behind or it's just changed, as we, many of you think. Some think there'll be piles of clothes everywhere. The Bible doesn't say that, but maybe. But regardless, we'll be changed. We'll have a glorified body instantly. We won't go through the door of death. We'll be changed in a moment and meet the Lord in the air and all the dead that sleep in Jesus, as the Bible tells us. See, the Lord is coming back. Amen. What a promise. What victory as we look at this world that the Lord is coming back. Yes, this may be in our life or this circumstance or this issue, this problem, this trial, this disease, this sickness, but the Lord is coming back. And this mortal will put on immortality. This corruption will put on incorruption. We have victory over death. We don't have to face eternal death. God has given us victory over death through Jesus. I love 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. The Bible says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest or revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Comparing these two passages, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, and this passage, he says he has abolished death and has brought life to light and immortality through the gospel. Think about it. God has brought this wonderful life through Jesus. It's been revealed in Christ Jesus. Victory over death. Some doubt and say, well, this is all the life we'll ever have. We better live it up now. This is all you're going to have. When you die, it's all over. There's no life after death. Well, God talked about these people. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 10, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Interesting what God says here. For this they willingly are ignorant of. See, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Because all of us know there is a God. God has revealed himself in creation and in conscience. We all know. For they are willingly ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heaven and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But as long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. See, the day of the Lord will come. 
And God is going to show us the victory over death. We've laid, not long ago, loved ones in our church to rest. But they will not stay there. When that trumpet sounds, we'll meet them in the air. They know the Lord is Savior. There will be victory. Whether it's us this next year that will have the funeral, of, whether it's me or you, we know there'll be victory over death. God has given us the victory. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I love how the Lord emphasizes this victory over death. 1 Thessalonians 4, we'll come back to 1 Corinthians 15. But 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, someone has said that the ignorant brethren is one of the biggest audiences in uh, the Word of God. <laughs> he mentions this again in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, <laughs> concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, we have hope because death is not final. God has given us the victory over death. Look, I don't want to die. Some people say, are you ready to die? I'm ready. I don't want to go in the next load, you know. But we are all looking for the rapture. That's what I want, don't you? I'd rather go through the rapture. Because death is unknown, you know. Uh, we believe what the Bible says, but we've not walked that path before. And it's an unknown thing. We all fear death. That's a natural thing. There's a natural fear of death. But thank the Lord until it's our time. He's protected us. It's only in God's timing. I remember in Indiana, God protected me. I was driving right near the church there when we were living there, and it had a funny, some of these interstate, you know, connections are different. There's one like that here as you go towards Vance, if you get off Interstate 4, uh, well, 2059 at that point at exit uh, 97, uh, where we used to live over there in Tuscaloosa County in Vance. And when you get off that exit, there's no stop sign for the person getting off the exit, but the people coming over the bridge there have to stop. So you come right off the exit, and you can turn right, and they have to stop. You don't have any stop. Some weird ones like that. I don't know why they chose to do different things, but the, some of these exits. Well, this is one like that in Angola, Indiana, right there, where we'd get off. The church was up on the hill right by the exit. It was just weird. They were in construction, I think, a whole two years we were there by that place. But it had a split lane where it was just one lane each way just for a minute there, right? As you go past the church, it splits, and there's the exits, and then it comes back together. Well, there was a lot of people that would come. There was a, uh, a national park right there, and people would come and vacation there and different things. And it, we'd have issues sometimes with people not realizing how to do that exit and that split. And uh, here I am driving to work one day, and my mind's on something else. All of a sudden, I look up and realize this guy's coming straight at me. He's turned on the one lane the wrong way, and it just splits for a little bit there. But uh, he's coming right at me. Well, this other guy in front of me swerves out of the way, and they both swerve to miss each other the same way. And so instead of, you know, one swerving this way and that way, they both swerve and hit each other head on. I don't think anyone was hurt. Uh, I, I can't remember all what happened there, but um, I was right there. could have been me. The Lord protected me. Uh, just the other day, in fact, Thursday, we're getting ready to leave to go to the Independent Baptist Friends of Alabama uh, meeting there that we had in Auburn, Oblica. And I was coming home, coming right past Lacey's Grove there, coming back from uh, 26. And I don't know if the person didn't see me. Ford Expedition comes out of Lacey's Grove. May have been a Mormon. I don't know. But um, anyway, he pulls out, and I'm coming. And there is a turn lane there, but there was no traffic route. I can't imagine he was getting past the first lane. But I'm going uh, up 17 towards Helena, and he's turning out of Lacey's Grove. And he's coming right at my door. And I, I used the horn correctly. Mary would have been happy if she'd have been with me. Blew the horn and stuff, and he stayed in that center lane, and I got on by him. But, but uh, just things like that, just a moment, how things can happen, how God protects us. But whether we go in death through the door of death or whether we go in the rapture, God has given us victory over death. It's God which giveth us the victory. It wasn't God's timing. Hallelujah. And number two, I want you to notice tonight, victory over sin. Look at verse 53. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. We find here, well, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We see the victory over sin. See, the wages of sin is death, and the Bible says the strength or the sting of death is sin. The wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has won the victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is your victory? Oh, the Lord's taken that away. See, at salvation, we got victory. If you know the Lord here tonight, you got victory over the power, or excuse me, the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin. There's no sting in death anymore. It once was, before you knew Christ, had you died, the sting of death is sin. Because the wages of sin is eternal death and hell. But that sting's been removed. Death is not the same for a believer. That's why God says comfort one another with these words. We don't sorrow as others that have no hope because when we close our eyes in death, it's not death with that sting. It's a door we step through into eternal life with the Lord Jesus for everlasting. We believe what the Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. God has given us the victory over sin. What a joy to have the victory over the uh, penalty of sin. I can remember when I got saved, my dad used to always say, I remember him saying it over and over, he'd say, if you're born once, you have to die twice. But if you're born twice, you only have to die once. You ever hear someone say that? Yeah, my dad used to say that all the time. And it would stay in my mind, you're born twice, you only have to die once. But if you're only born once, you have to die twice. And we know what he's talking about, that for all people, there'll be a physical death unless we go in the rapture. There'll come that day, day when this body will be laid down in death and what we know in a funeral, what we see, and all of us understand physical death. But if you know Christ as Savior, hallelujah, you won't have to experience eternal death, that second death as God calls it. And I remember putting my faith in the Lord as a young man at eight years old and recognizing that I deserve that second death. But Jesus had offered that new birth. You must be born again. And I put my faith in him and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And through Jesus Christ our Lord, and I receive Christ as my Savior, repenting of my sin and putting my faith in what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. And hallelujah, he gives victory over sin, the penalty of sin. Every day, God wants us now, if you're saved, he wants us now to have victory over the power of sin. And he gives us that. Notice 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let me read it for you. And you can turn back a page if you'd like. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. We sang about that tonight, didn't we? Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I'm so happy to be free in Christ. Aren't you? Amen. Free in Christ. And see, before we were saved, there was no way of escape. We were bound in the chains of sin. We were, uh, we were followers of this world system. We were, we were headed in this same path like everyone on the broad way to go over the cliff into eternal death. But God has freed us from the chains of sin. We're not bound by what the world says is is cool or good or what we should wear or what we should listen to. I'm free from all that. I don't have to be a part of that. I'm free. God has given us victory over sin. We don't have to succumb to what the world says we ought to do or look like or go or all of that type of thing. And then one day we're going to have victory over the very presence of sin. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I like in Revelation, the Bible says that the devil, that old deceiver is going to be shut up. Wouldn't you like the devil to be shut up right now? Uh, not just physically, but his mouth shut up. He's going to be shut up. And one day for eternity, he'll be cast in that lake of fire. Don't you get sick of sin? 
We don't need the devil to sin. Our old nature has plenty of sinfulness in it. Don't you get sick of your own sin? I love Romans 7 as Paul says, well, I don't want to do that's what I do. And, I, and just, oh, the body of this death. He's talking about carrying around this body of death. You're sick of it. There's victory in Jesus. I love how he ends Romans chapter 7. There's victory in Jesus. I get sick of sin in my own life, coming back to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, that was sin. That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that, did that, thought that. See, sin is anything we do, we say, anything we think that breaks God's law. But we can have victory. God wants us to have victory. Hudson Taylor said this, great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, we are a supernatural people. Born again by a supernatural birth, we wage a supernatural fight and are taught by a supernatural teacher, led by a supernatural captain to assured victory. I like that, to assure victory. See, verse 57 here in 1 Corinthians 15, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll come to the last thing tonight. Thirdly, not only victory over death, victory over sin, but victory to be steadfast. Victory to be steadfast. Verse 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He comes to the end of this great chapter. I wish we had time to go through it. Time wouldn't allow us to go through all 57 verses to get to verse 58 in one sitting. But he goes through all about the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us and what he's purchased by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he comes to the victory here we've talked about. And then he says this word, therefore. And in the scriptures, when you see the word wherefore or therefore, it's referring back. And they used to help us remember what that by saying, when you see the word therefore, in Bible college, they taught us this, you need to look back and see what it's there for. <laughs> college students even can remember that, you know. So when you see the word therefore, you need to look back and see what it's there for. It's referring back. And we could show you examples of that in the Word of God, but you'll find them if you look for them. Therefore, he says, he said all of this about what God has purchased for us and what God has done for us. Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can all shout, Amen, glory to God, hallelujah, all that God has given us in Jesus Christ. But then he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as you know. It's your labor and not in vain in the Lord. You see, the first two things we looked at, victory over death, victory over sin, and there's more in this passage that we backed up. All of those things are inevitable. If you know Christ is Savior, God's already won victory over death. He's already defeated Satan, and the victory is ours. Victory over the penalty of sin has already happened. He sees us seated in the heavenlies with him now. Practically, we're not there yet, but positionally, we are seated with him. He sees us as if it's already there, because God looks over time. He is eternal. He is living in eternity. He sees the end from the beginning. They're inevitable. They're going to happen in the future. And Paul says, here's the one thing you can do. Here's what you can change, and that is today. Those two are God's part. Here's your part. Therefore, because of all that God's purchased for us, all that He's done, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so he's saying to us what God is looking for in you and me is he's looking for someone that is faithful. You know, we have special days and special days is an easy time when you've passed that special day to kind of exhale. You've been working towards it, looking forward to it. And if we're not careful, you get tired, you know. But God says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, don't back off this thing because... As much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, I like what he has for us here. Let me, let's think about just a couple of things under this. How do we have victory over the world? Well, 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See, God's looking for faithful men. 
isn't for faithful men and women that are faithful to church. Uh, faithful uh, in, in their mindset as they think about church. Let me ask you, what does your calendar revolve around? Uh, when you set things down, I'm getting ready as I'm planning 2017 and setting certain things on the calendar, and you work around all those certain things that are planning for the church, but what do you plan in your family's calendar? What does your calendar revolve around? What's your life about? What goes first on the calendar? See, it becomes a mindset. It's a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, if you will, that we put God First, our life revolves around what God's work is doing and what God, where God has placed us. And this is what God's people, that's what they plan their lives around, what's going on in God's work. What God's given us, this church and what's happening. What do you make everything else fit around in life? I remember a lady that went to church in Kentucky and, and we liked their family. We were trying to encourage them. They were new in the church. But she said when American Idol season started, I remember her saying, we won't be here on Wednesday night. American Idol's on on Wednesday night. And again, we were trying to help her, the new Christians, but I'll tell you, there are a lot of Christians that their life revolves around something else than what it should. Appreciate her honesty. You know, I don't agree with it, of course. But what does your life revolve around? What's your life revolve around? It's a way of life, a way of thinking. We're to be faithful in our worship our church, our attendance, our walk with the Lord, faithful in our walk, our prayer, our Bible study, our time with God, our living a life that becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ, as the Bible talks about, and then faithful in our witness. God's looking for faithful people, faithful. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man, who can find? A faithful man. You all know 1 Corinthians 4, 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful. See, God doesn't say it's required. We're all to be stewards. We all are stewards. God says everything you own is mine. Your very breath is mine. Your strength is mine. Your life is mine. I own everything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. What? Know you not that your body... <laughs> Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So we're God's lock, stock, and barrel. Every part of us, the next breath, the next heartbeat, all of it belongs to Him. The next day, the next moment. And so we're all stewards. We all, excuse me, we all are playing with house money. <laughs> None of it's ours. So this day, this life, this next year is all God. So what will I do? How will I live? I'm a steward. Moreover, it is required. Here's the requirement for stewards, that a man, man be found mighty. No. Here's the requirement for stewards, that a man be found winsome. No, that's not it. Moreover, it is required in stewards, that a man be found capable. No. Faithful. Amen. Faithful. I love that God gives something that everybody can be. You may be a one-talent person or a ten-talent person. You may be someone that has lots of money or someone that has little money. You may be someone that has lots of influence or little influence. Lots of different factors, but one thing that we can all be is faithful. Someone that God can count on, like they've said, the greatest ability is availability. You are there you are faithful, you are walking with the Lord, you're faithful to the church, you're faithful in God's work, you're faithful in being a witness. Faithful, that's what God is looking for. That's what God has called us to. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in, the vain, in vain in the Lord. Why is our labor not in vain in the Lord? Because God giveth the victory. See, God will give the victory. You stay faithful. You wait. You see. God will give the victory. Now, you may have to go into the fiery furnace. The three, three Hebrew children, they had to go pretty far before they saw victory, but God gave the victory. He showed up in the fire, and they were promoted, and God was glorified. God is going to get the victory. In conclusion tonight, we've seen some victory in this church. No doubt about it. Lord has blessed us. We're thrilled about people being saved and people baptized. And thank the Lord for Liz this morning making public her salvation. And pray for her, follow the Lord in baptism. Come from a Catholic background, you know what 
that entails. But to continue in victory, and we want to continue to have victory, we must continue to be faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's God which giveth us the victory. See, God hasn't called us to get the victory. Aren't you glad? He hasn't called us to get the victory. Verse 57 says, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad He hadn't called you to get the victory? He's called us to be faithful. Lord, you've been faithful, we sang about tonight. And God's been faithful to us. He's asking us to be faithful to Him. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God's called us to victory. You might say this world's so wicked. Yeah. You can look at the dark and gloomy world. It can be discouraging. You're in the newspaper, listen to the news. But I'm here to tell you, we have God. And it is God which giveth the victory. This world's so full of sin. People aren't interested in hearing about God anymore. What's the use of trying? They're not interested in spiritual things. Well, I like what, since you're in 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So some people haven't even heard yet. Some people can't say they're not interested yet because they don't even know. I remember in Indiana where we were, I met a guy named Brad, 29 years old. He'd never been in a church in his whole life. Never. Didn't know anything about church. Just as uh, totally ignorant as you can imagine. Married to a girl. Both had been on drugs and drinking and so on. He got saved and began to grow. And, and never had he been in church in his whole life. Never. Never heard about being saved in the United States of America. There are people still out there that don't know. There are people here in Alabama and not too far from this church that have not heard. See, God's called us to be faithful. Romans 15, 19 to 21 is encouragement about this. It says, or maybe Romans 5, excuse me, 19 21. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the disobedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sinneth reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. See, when the day is dark and the time is sinful, grace more abounds, God says. God's grace is sufficient. Even in this age, even in this world we live in, His grace is still able to save the sinner. His grace is still able to continue to help the saint to be faithful, to give us the strength to step forward and move on. The question is, will you be faithful? Are you a faithful Christian? Therefore, look all that God's done. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God hadn't called us to get the victory. He's called us to be faithful. And aren't you glad we have the God that giveth the victory, the God of the victory? Amen. The safari hunter was startled as they were out on this safari. He was, had his rifle ready. He was looking. All of a sudden, his bird's going nuts up in the tree. Going around this branch and carrying on, like, what in the world's going on with this bird? I used to hate the kill deer up in Canada. Had them, and they're all over. I found they run around the parking lot like their wings broke, and they run, they're trying to lead you away from their nest. You ever seen the kill deer type of birds? Anyway, that's not a violent thing towards deer. It's a type of bird. Anyway, um, <laughs> this bird's doing the same thing. This safari hunter, what in the world? He has his gun in his hand. He could have done some help to help this bird because he realizes coming up the tree is this huge snake. He's in Africa. He's interested to see what's going to happen. Here this bird's going nuts, going around its nest. This snake's making its way up, coming up, knowing it's got eggs in the nest. All of a sudden, the bird flies off. Snake's still coming. Now he's watching what's going to happen. In just a moment, the bird comes back with a leaf, this branch with leaves on it in its mouth. Lays it over the nest flies to the next tree and watches. Snake keeps coming. Gets up there about to strike. And like he saw a predator stops. Like he sees an enemy stops. Releases his coal and begins making his way back down the tree. He couldn't believe it. 
Safari hunter later asked the African native and said, what happened? I saw this bird going crazy, huge snake coming up, about to have supper. What was that? What happened? Uh, the Africans laughed as they explained the unlikely victory of the bird. He said those leaves that he put over the egg, the nest, are poison to the snake. Poison to the snake. And it's a life-saving shield for those birds. You know, the word of God, though our faith may seem flimsy, is a life-saving shield. It's where our faith resides in our Lord and what we find in his word. And it gives the victory over our serpentine enemy. It's God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God has the victory. He's called us to a life of faith, trusting Him.